Buddies live coding session. Code Buddies is a global community of amazing people who help each other become better at software development through conversations on Slack and peer to peer organized study groups and virtual hangouts. Today, we'll be continuing the Western Friend website project. The subscription feature. Western Friend is the official publication of Quakers in the Pacific, North Pacific, and Intermountain Yearly Meetings. It's a nonprofit organization and they have an online magazine subscription um, where you can get a print, PDF, and online uh, access to the articles. In the magazine section of the website, subscribers get full access to the most recent three articles. The issues are published every other month. So that's three issues in the last six months. Beyond that, the archive issues are publicly available for anyone going back to 1929. So it's 1929, it's quite a long archive, almost 100 years of Western Friend magazines that are, that are publicly available. Uh, so they're just, it's a nonprofit, it's trying to do a little bit of uh, fundraising through the uh, um, subscriptions and uh, donations, which will be another feature we'll be going into, as well as the bookstore, which we've already developed in previous live coding sessions. When I say live coding, this video, if you're watching this later, is um, going to be me um, trying to figure out how things work and doing a couple of tasks um, in real time. So this is not a summary video and I will probably encounter problems and have to figure those out. So that's part of the game when we're doing this. This is the original website. It's developed in Drupal. And here is the new website developed with Python, Django, and the Wagtail CMS. Today we're going to continue the subscription feature as I mentioned. Um, the changes we're going to make, if I hop over here to subscription, will be in the model. And let's see, there's a couple of things I wanted to check real quick. Uh, but let's hop into the models file. So currently, um, when somebody subscribes, we need a way to look up their subscription so that when they log in, we can check, does this person have an active subscription? Uh, the way I had figured that out, while they're browsing the magazine, they, we need to know if they have an active subscription in order to, to render it either a teaser or the full article, basically, when they're viewing a particular article. So here's the article teaser. I'm an anonymous user, and this is a recently published, um, well, I actually don't have the logic in there for the time uh, timeliness of the article. So it's just showing the teaser because I don't have a subscription. That'll be a subsequent development. Let's take a quick look at that code in the magazine app. And in the, let's see, I'm not using views. I actually I did define one view here a while back. Okay. Essentially, <clears throat> When we render, whew, come on, there we go, a magazine article, you can see the model here. I'm overriding the page context. The context is what gets um, the data that gets rendered into the HTML template. HTML template is just a got some placeholder values there, and we're checking whether or not the current user has a subscription by cross-referencing their email with an email field on the subscription up here. So every subscription has several fields and we have a subscriber email. I went that route because it was pretty flexible and simple. And on review, Mary and I decided we would rather have a requirement that a person has to have an account before they can subscribe. So in the previous session, um, I created a flow that allows you to register or log in in order to subscribe. So that took a while. Today, now that we've got that kind of constraint in place, I can add a foreign key relationship from the subscription pointing to the user. Every subscription is linked to one user. But a user can have multiple subscriptions. They should be non-overlapping. So actually, this might be a, an opportunity to use a new feature in Django, 
which is database constraints. The problem is I believe these uh, constraints are only available in the Postgres, so that might actually introduce a little bit of complexity to the development process. We'll come back to that later. So let's do that. We'll, we'll still need all these fields on the subscription instance. So let's just say I log in with my example, or my, yeah, testing user, super secret password. Then we see the subscription form. This is all stuff that we've developed a, a few weeks ago. When this form is submitted, it is sent to this, this is the subscription index page that allows us to display an intro text, which you can see here I edited that in the title. If I edit the, edit the page, we can change that intro text. And so we call that the subscription index page. That's kind of like the landing page. It could be at least called that as well. Again, we're checking out the page context. And we had some conditional logic here to put in a subscription for, a registration form if they are not if they are in the, uh, not registered yet, or they're not logged in, and they want to create a new account, that way they can do that in situ, like the, without kind of having the appearance of leaving that subscribe now page. And in the serve, we're processing either the registration form or the subscription. So in the second half, after registering or logging in, you'll subscribe. Now, when we process the subscription form, essentially it validates the form and saves it. Today we're going to add just a little bit of logic here in a new field to the magazine subscription model. Let's make sure it stays open by double clicking it. That creates a foreign key relationship from the subscription to the user and it makes that connection here. We don't actually publish that. Um, Yeah, we won't publish, sorry, let me just think for one second. We won't display uh, any kind of widget for the end user to select themselves or enter their own uh, unique identifier. They, they wouldn't have any knowledge of that. So I'll have to figure out where in this flow, if before validating the form, perhaps attaching it there, and then validating it and saving it. Well, let's go ahead and learn how this is going to work. So the first thing will be to add a model, uh, a field to the subscription model. So we'll come up here again, magazine. Oh, that's the wrong. Subscription model, that's where I am actually. <laughs> Same file, at least. Here we are. Oh yes, before I get started though, Got some tea that should just be ready. My favorite caffeine free chai combo turmeric chai from Yogi Tea and Puka vanilla chai, both caffeine free because it's just after eight o'clock here in Finland. I've got this Oatly. It's like milk, but made for humans. And it's got this good creamy flavor for coffee and tea. And a low climate footprint. 3.3 kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram of Oatly. Hmm. It is abstract, those climate footprints. We've got to make those more concrete, I think. Oh, no, no, it's not 30%. Yeah, 3.2 kilograms. Hmm, yep, too abstract <laughs> to be useful. Dang it. So here's some tea. At least to my sleepy brain. I've only had like a, three hours of sleep last night. Couldn't sleep. So I'm trying to take some easy tasks today. Take it easy on myself. There will be a recap video after this. So if you're just wanting to 
see the changes and not watch the pro the development process. That's perfectly understandable. Uh, and have a habit of just summarizing the changes in like a 10 minute to 15 minute video, depending on how many changes there are. If you're watching this on another platform after the fact. Cool. So let's go ahead and add a foreign key. I'll just look up a quick recipe to make sure I'm doing things in a conventional manner. So Django, uh, I just realized one other plan we have is to make a custom user model. So actually this might be the chance to do the custom user model first. That way my foreign key is gonna to point to the right model and I don't have to redefine it. In fact, I have this tab already open, custom user model. So that was actually gonna be part B, but now I just realized I should do this in part A. The reason we want to do a custom user model is so that we can add a field to it. And basically the lesson that I've read from Two Scoops of Django, which I should really get this book, uh, present this on the stream. I have it over there in my bookshelf. But um, you have to define a custom user model early in your project because once you're deployed, once you're in production, I guess it's just a pain to migrate an existing user model. So get that out of the way real early if you can do it. So we'll do it now while we're still in development mode. All right, so I think to do a custom user model, and actually while we're on this topic, I will get my Two Scoops of Django book and refer to that as well because that book outlines um, very clearly um, excellent patterns to follow in Django development that you don't normally find through just the Django uh, docs. So I will be right back while I grab that book. Excellent, I am back. I've got two scoops of Django for Django 1.11. If you have just a little bit of budget, even for just the ebook, I highly recommend it if you're interested in Django development. Really great. Uh, it's humorous, it's very well written, it's pretty large, very comprehensive. It has pictures, funny pictures too. Diagrams, call outs, all sorts of good stuff here. This is not a paid endorsement. I actually just really like this book. I, this is the second edition that I've bought. I bought one uh, for Django 1.6 or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, Django 1.11 is a long-term support edition. So the knowledge in this book will stay relevant for years, um, even though Django 2 is out. In fact, uh, this project is using Django 2.2, I think it is. So it's still largely the same. So let's see what they have to say about custom user model. Oh, dude, check it out. This is an autographed copy. Nice. <laughs> I think it's, I don't remember if it was a pre-order or what. Why they autographed it. All these, not just mine. So, coding style, the optimal Django environment setup. I should have done this earlier because they have some good stuff. And actually, Wagtail does a lot of these. When you create a new Wagtail project, it sets you up with Docker. Uh, you're going to probably be using a version control system anyway, like Git. They use pip and virtual, and we're using pip and. Uh, it's a little bit of a trade off, a little bit. Um, yeah, I like it though. How to lay out Django projects. I haven't followed their guidelines. I've just stuck with what Wagtail created us. Fundamentals of Django app design. Setting up requirements files. Model best practices. Queries in the database. Function class-based views. Best class uh, practices for function-based views. Django templates in Jinja 2. You can actually, you don't have to use the Django templating language. 
building REST APIs with Django REST framework. Well, uh, Wagtail does this automatically to a certain extent. I think we even might have a GraphQL API, but don't quote me on that. I think just by defining your models, though, you get like REST for free. I'm going to have to check into that. Don't quote me. Consuming REST APIs, replacing core components, working with the Django admin, dealing with the user model. Here we go. Chapter 20. So they hit the user model chapter kind of far at the end. Ah, very cool. So actually, Django has a helper function for this. Page 272, let me check it out. And I'll check the Django docs. It says get user model as a helper function, 272. Just keep, just keep passing. Okay. So it looks like they're in this book are doing recommending the same approach that um, Wagtail recommends is extending the Django contrib auth model abstract user. They they also recommend a project called Django auth tools. It's a library that makes defining custom user models easier. Of particular use are the abstract email user and abstract named user models. Even if you don't end up using Django auth tools, the source code is well worth examining. Let's take that advice real quick. Uh, Mary and I are not sure we'll want to have usernames in our Wagtail instance. We're not really sure if there will be like a social feature where you would at mention somebody or where a username would really be useful. For that, we might, if ever needed, turn to something pre-existing, like a forum solution like Discourse. Or I've been looking at a couple of options. Uh, there's one written in Django I can't remember. So um, our user model can be pretty simple, but we do need an email so we can communicate with the users. So let's check out Django Auth. Tools. Oh, it's just all one word. And it supports the long term support versions and above LTS one point eleven and above. Looks pretty straightforward. And I guess you would just pick the, um, the particular model. Because we do want a custom user model. Skin's a little bit dry. I got this as a gift though. This is it works really good. O'Keefe's working hands. It's pretty mild for extremely dry cracked hands. And I live in Finland and uh, midwinter, well, not quite midwinter, but in the winter it gets pretty dry, man. So, then my son and I have been going to the swimming pool and stuff. The chlorinated water, excellent. So I think there, that package is kind of indicating that you might not need 
If you want to extend the uh, user model, you might not need their package. Oh, I see. Okay, so we would essentially follow oh, sorry, these instructions for writing the user model, but instead of using abstract user, we would create an abstract named user. It preserves all the fields that are in the built-in user model, but adds a name and treats email as the username. Well, that's what we essentially want. I don't know if we want a named user. So this is, I guess it's not so bad if you do go down the road of having used the default user model and then want to switch to a custom one later. Looks like there's only a couple of steps needed. Migrations involved, so we just want to get it out of the way. Uh, let me just quickly go back to GitHub. I want to see how well maintained this project is. It's October 17th. 20 contributors, whoosh, it's like, maybe it does the job really good. It's been around for a while, and maybe it doesn't need to be overly complicated. You yeah, know, hope that's... kept simple enough. And I think this is what I would want to override, uh, not override, extend or inherit from. Abstract email user that creates an email field and uses that email field for uh, the full name, short name, And gives us a way to email them. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Well, we have used some extensions in this. I'm just, the only reason I'm mainly hesitant is, um, well, most recently I've come from Meteor.js and that whole ecosystem is imploding. So that's that. And then in, in Drupal, we've used some of the contrib modules that have actually kept us from being able to migrate from seven to eight, like, which was fortuitous because then we just decided, well, let's check out Wagtail. Uh, and then going back to WordPress, I can't remember modules being, or plugins uh, being blockers, just that that whole WordPress ecosystem is just a mess. Not even touching that. Everything's got a pro version. It's just a mess. So I don't know. I'm just trying to think if they if I have a strong intuition, I shouldn't use any uh, any modules here. I think we'll go with it. <laughs> At the recommendation of Daniel Roy Greenfield and Audrey Roy Greenfield, who had a baby recently, or somewhat recently, I don't know. This year, I think it was. <laughs> Cool. All right, let me put my book down. So we have to use actually pip pen. Auth tools. Ooh. 
we're not going to follow these readme instructions verbatim because we're going to define a custom user model. I don't know if I want to use their URL scheme. <laughs> Let's see if this breaks uh, the current registration flow. It shouldn't, hopefully it'll. If, if I tell Django what the base user model is, we should be good to go. All right, so we'll need to set the auth user model. Do this before creating any migrations or running ManagePy migrate for the first time. Meaning we'll have to dump the database or nuke it. Uh, and this is also good advice. I wish it would just uh, do that for us automatically when creating a new Django project. It is highly recommended you set up a custom user model even if the default user model is sufficient for you. This model behaves identically to the default user model but you'll be able to customize it in the future if the need arises. So it doesn't really give you step-by-step step how to do it. That's, I guess they're expecting you have some advanced, uh, relatively advanced knowledge, so to speak. So we'll do Python, manage Pi, start app, I think it's start app, accounts. And we're using accounts here because that's the conventional uh, name for things account related. In other words, these account URLs and stuff. It would just it just makes sense. It makes it a little bit cleaner to refer to the same thing with the same terms. So and it's also alphabetically up top. Views, models, apps. So, ah, I'm losing the context here. And this is probably good advice. I haven't read these articles, but uh, to the extent possible, we're just going to have this using, uh, sorry, just use this user model for logging in and logging out and the association of uh, subscriptions with the active user. Uh, and then we might create a um, user profile next uh, to track the extra metadata we want to add to the user, such as the Western friend subscriber, uh, subscriber number, which is sort of an offline thing Mary's been tracking for several years in a spreadsheet. So. That was what brought up this whole topic. Instructions real quick. Hmm, I want you to do that right off the bat. Huh. Here's what I was looking for. Yeah, installed apps. So we go to this. The core, I'm having a hard time renaming this. I'd like to rename it core, but 
couldn't figure out how to do it. I get these weird errors, can't track them down. I've never been able to figure out how to rename this sort of core settings folder after creating a project. Here we are. The base settings, we need all of our installed apps. So these are our internal apps, and these are for extensions that we add. You can see we've just used a few extensions, not too many. But um, Crispy Forms has been really nice. Django extensions, I think, gives us a couple of useful things, including, the, I don't know if it's got the debug toolbar, I should really be using that to optimize the site. All right, and then we will be switching the auth user model. So well, this will actually just be, be done. So is this just going to look in the account app models for the user model? That's quite interesting. Hmm. Seems like I would need to say accounts on models user. Very strange. Yeah, we don't want to register with the Django admin. Not yet. We want to create the model in the database. I don't want to add any custom fields right now. I think I understand now why they need us to register the account URLs. I guess we would do that in uh, base URLs. First, let me see if this will work with the without changing the URLs. It might just work. I will. Yep. So now I need to change the settings pie to. Oops. Be aware of our new app. Our Ah, settings, the base settings, and add our new app, which was accounts. 
Now it should be able to find it. Get a little more space here. We'll migrate now. Ah, uh, first I'm gonna make migration just in 10 minutes. That's cool. Whoops. And I uh, bypassed that. So now it's uh, behaving correctly. Let's see if these uh, uh, URLs just work. If that's the case, I'll be really grateful and not have to modify this. Particularly, I want to have um, a single step registration flow. I don't know quite what that is. But that was something that was added by Wagtail by default, I suppose. Hmm. So Django registration is a third-party project. Okay. Ah, yeah. To the HMAC. Yeah, pretty slick. Mm, I don't know if we'll want that in the long run. Um, we'll see how that interrupt, how that affects the registration flow, for example, on the subscri I mean, the subscription flow. Keep it simple for now. Whoops. All right, so we'll hop back to the front just to see if things are just totally, well, yeah, so now we've lost all the content. That's cool, that's to be expected. So we'll add some content. Now I've used my email address, so that's working automatically. No, 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 that's, uh... Signed in just fine. Very cool, let's check out the user page here. It left the first name and last name fields alone. That's cool. Uh, so let's just set up some really quick um, content. We need a home page. We actually can delete this page. Create one home page instance, which should be the only thing I can create at the top. It's called welcome. the Western Friend homepage. And publish that. We'll need a subscription index page to get us back in the swing of things. That's why. Now that I deleted that initial page, I have to just tell Wagtail. Uh, we have, uh, it automatically deleted our site. Wagtail is multi-site out of the box, which is really cool. So, home page and make it the default site. So yeah, now we're back up and running. If I now just go to the front view, it looks good. These links in the menu are hard coded, but if I go to subscribe, boom, it sees that I'm logged in. If I log out, zoom, it wants me to register. Let's the moment of truth. Ah, uh, here we go. So yeah, this this um, form I wrote, so I will fix that. 
The login form, though, that's automatically generated. Yes. Very cool. And this, the whole reason I had to write a custom sign up page or register page, and as opposed to using this register page, which just works correctly, is because this doesn't allow me to have a next argument. I think I should open that as a feature request for, for, um, Django account, I suppose, is where it would be. They would be consistent with the login page because it has this next and it, it'll allow the user to go back to the context in which they were prior to logging in. In any case, for now, let's get back to it. Model. Actually, the form. Here's this user registration form. I'll just take out the username. It's a small change. Very cool. Hop back over to subscribe. Register, and there we are. Email address, password, password confirmation. Okay, that was a surprisingly easy change to add a new uh, custom user model. Hmm. Very nice. Now I'm at 40 minutes and it's almost nine o'clock. So actually, um, let me see how far I can get on this foreign key relationship and I think I'll probably cut it. Call the live code good. Like I said, I just want to take it a little bit easy tonight. Drink some relaxing tea. It's really unfortunate I can't have music on the live stream. It'll like interfere, it'll like copyright strike me or something. Or mute the audio. If you have music on Twitch, it mutes all the, the stream audio for the videos. And it's like phew, ridiculous. Okay, I mean, I can put it on headphones. Yeah, maybe I'll do that next time. I have something like live, like what's playing on the bottom bar there or something from my last FM feed or whatever. Hmm. Might be cool. And then you at home could <laughs> synchronize that or something now anyway. Uh, Yeah, so let's look at how this foreign key works after. After committing these changes. So I'm going to delete this SQL back file because we're just done with that now. SQLite. And da, 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 da. I still haven't committed this. Essentially, this is what I was after when I give the link to accounts login, I can pass a next to get people back to that subscribe page, but I had to write a custom view, um, actually a block of logic in my already existing view to, to look for this register is true and had the registration form in there and all this stuff. It could have just been so simple if the, re the default accounts registration page would just allow me to use next equals subscribe. So maybe, maybe that'll be a feature request if I can just get around to it. Less is more in terms of the end user, the developer having to write the code, if it can go into the framework and it's not too polluting. I understand that frameworks get complicated, but uh, that's what they're there for. Is they're, they're there to grow and, and pave over common use cases and even some uncommon use cases. So I'll commit this. I like this Django Auth tools. That was a great rec recommendation. Thank you again. Uh, two scoops in. Two scoops of Django. Roy and uh, what are they? Daniel and Aubrey. Roy. Aubrey. Oh gosh, goodness. Daniel Roy Greenfield and Audrey Roy Greenfield. Very good book.
All right, we'll just call it all good here. One commit more or less, except for the model. Tests, I'm not sure what I would test in this one. And if we don't have views and we don't have admin, I think I should just actually delete the files we're not using as a as a habit. Excuse me. So Wagtail Admin is actually doing the admin-y stuff for us. This is some important stuff, so I'll leave it alone. I don't know what it's for, but and I'll leave test as a friendly reminder, although I don't know what to test in this case, but there it is. Yeah, I don't think we'll need any views. Good. See the difference here? Oh, it's a white space difference. Good, all right. Kind of grouped all those together, but that's fine. These last few commits. All right, let's try this foreign key now. Clean up some tabs. Probably look at the Wagtail page model. So that by so I think every subscription. Sorry, I'm, I should be thinking aloud, so it's clear what I'm doing here. So yeah, we're gonna use our auth user model. That's good, and give it a verbose name. Name um, owner might be cool. Subscription owner, hmm. or just user. Owner's cool though. Uh, I don't think it should be nullable. We'll see how that affects the form the submission process. I think. As long as I add the subscription prior to validation, we should be good to go. We'll find out. This is editable true. This is nice, and I believe this will allow the editor to make adjustments. Uh, in which case, it might be nullable as true. Well, 
I can change that later. That's a migration we can change without just drawing data. And it's easier to go from strict to lenient than lenient to strict. Because then if you're lenient to strict, it's like, well, what's the default value for all these ones that don't have a user? Hmm. Uh, on delete, so when they, huh. Ah. When the user account is deleted, if, hmm. I don't think we'd want it to cascade. If we want to keep a, a history of subscriptions, oh, I'm going to think that one through. This would just be subscriptions from the user. No, we can get their subscriptions, plural. And I can make a model manager that lets us get their active subscription, which there only should ever be one of those. I'll have to figure out a way to constrain that. And I think there's a new feature in Django that gives us a database constraint. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So let's take this as is, except I'm just what are the other options for on delete? Jingle model on delete. I've looked at this up before. There's cascade. No, but it has to be nullable. On delete. What are the options? Single constraint on the database, support for database level cascade, maybe implemented later. Cascade protect. Prevent the deletion of the referenced object by raising protection error. Hmm. Yes, you can't delete a user that has subscriptions because that would break things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like it. And then we will just not allow it to be null or blank. Uh, I'll talk to Mary and I'll explain that this is a pretty strict setting. We also have to keep in mind we're going to be uh, both migrating users and subscriptions from Drupal, but also that some of the users they subscribe on uh, offline through forms or just other ways like they could marry a check or something. And they, so we don't always have a user account, which is where the null and blank is true might be useful if Mary wants to use this as a sort of a CRM or well, that wouldn't even be a CRM because we don't have the contact or the constituent who has the subscription in that case. I don't want to overthink this. Let's roll. Sorry, but sometimes you got to just reason through these. It's not just a matter of like kind of getting the code written and working. It's you got to you know think about second and third order uh, consequences or considerations, and it's not always e easy or apparent or possible or correct when you do that. All right, so if we go to the subscription here, I tried moving these address fields into their own model, but there was just some mm, difficulties with the user experience that that introduced. Particularly, oh, it is. Yeah, uh, Wagtail gives you this modal dialog to select an instance. Let's actually take a look at that. But uh, so, it's just subscriber will be above the. Mm, no, I guess subscriber user can be down here. I don't. It doesn't matter. Let's figure it out. User. Line. 
but it's offline, so not in the wagtail. Editable is cool, and we want to protect. So you cannot delete the user account if they've ever subscribed or anything like that. It would cause loss of data or data integrity issues. I like it. I like it. And owner is cool. Subscription is cool. Subscriptions is cool. And the settings has not been imported. So I just take a look over here. Stations in this app. Gotta be careful with copy and pasting code that you read it very closely and you understand what's going on. And even then, sometimes the Django code is so clean and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. But underneath, like, I don't know what it's doing and uh, had some troubles with that last session. But this I understand a little bit and it's very subtle. But this is uh, using Git text to, to translate this between languages. Wagtail by design is a multilingual system. I like double quotes, I don't know. So they've got all of their user-facing text localized. And since I copy and pasted from the core page model, then that's that. But now we should be good to go. We can create this migration. And it wants a one-off default. I guess that assigns it to the user number one which is significant in Drupal. The number of one user is like the admin user. I don't know if Django does that. I think it's just request out user. If, I, if I'm just gonna wing it and guess and hope that Django in this case is very intuitive and straightforward. And plus I think I've read something along these lines and internalized it, but uh, let's try winging it here. How to connect the subscription to the user. So inside of our subscription app in the subscription model, which I already have open, <laughs> we have a subscription index page which is processing the subscription stuff. So when I go to process subscription form, I get the form here. I think, oh, I had this problem before. It's immutable. The request post uh, is immutable, but I'm creating a form. So that should not be immutable. Maybe. Let's try it. Well, that says it's a property there. So we want the, f the f basically the form to automatically link the, the user up at the time of subscription. Mm -hmm. So I will have to return. This is nice. 
How does it know that? Yeah, it's more or less before saving it. Changing form field value before saving. Dum -dum -dum -dum. So it looks like in the form definition over here, I can define a method. Ah, or just do it there. Wait. Hmm, that's confusing. Uh, also, I might be doing it wrong here. Let's give it a try. Let's give that a try. So we'll go back. I'm not logged in. Let's just log in with my testing user. I see. Oof. Okay. So fill in the details and subscribe. Ooh. On a subscription user ID, though. So yeah, not null uh, constraint failed. So does this mean the subscription app, subscription model? Where's the user ID field coming from? That's confusing. find that that's quite weird well I was hoping this would be straightforward and intuitive but again shouldn't guess uh, let's just say uh, foreign key user mm, and model so we know that will work but I need to also in the form Foreign key to user.
using them. He's right. You feel this is the weird part. Let me just check the form real quick. So we're not adding the user or user ID field anywhere in the subscription create form. Okay, so they're using it inside of this validation uh, block, so after validation. So they're creating a temporary instance of the entity in question, but not committing to the database, so it won't throw validation errors, I believe. Then we want to say subscription, because the form should validate. Hmm, if it's a model form though. The model has a strict requirement. Might be easier to skirt this by allowing null well, there's a model form here. Let me try this. So, subscription user equals, that was the intuitive part. And then I believe you just save it at that point. from the lines of code below that, but I like to keep these little snippets along the way. Hmm, looks like that worked. Okay, so that was really good. Not quite obvious. I wouldn't have, there's no way I would, well, yeah, not guess that. Commit this false part. Okay. So we'll go and pay by card. One twenty, paying with card. Boom. Now we'll hop to the back end. Yeah, I just gotta go to the wagtail icon. Hop over to the wagtail admin. Which, there we go. Now I can check out our subscriptions, and I've got this person. No, yeah, this is just generic details. Uh, if I edit, we will come down here, and it shows me as the owner and I can actually change it. That's not gonna be a very useful widget, uh, a, a select list of potentially hundreds of users. Anyway, if I make it editable equals false, uh, we'll just leave that alone for now. Good, and it works. And we got a brain tree reference, which is also editable. side
that's about it. Let's see, we're just 10 minutes beyond past the hour, past uh, one hour of broadcasting. 14 minutes past the hour. The clock. So yeah, I pretty much set out what I was hoping to do. A little bit slow, taking it nice and easy, learning uh, as we went. I will um, summarize these changes in a like a 10 minute video if anybody's made it to this point in the session. Uh, Appreciate it. Live stream. Hey, what's up? Aiden Link, uh, Linge says, hey, man, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I was thinking about wrapping up. Are you just joining the stream? I can stay around and work on a couple of other sort of low-hanging fruit if you'd like to see some more um, live coding. Let me just check our GitHub. Sorry if you sent that message a while ago and I didn't notice it, but I do try to keep my eye on there. Yeah, I just came by. Well, cool. Um, yeah, we're just wrapping up. Do you, have you worked with Django or anything before? I can actually get, yeah, I can add a couple of fields, these start and end dates. That might be a low hanging fruit. I did this custom user model today and only login users can subscribe. If we add these start and end dates, particularly, particularly the end date, We'll be both of those, I think, because then we can apply indexes to them. Let's take a look. Yeah, have you worked with um, Aiden? Have you worked with um, Django or done any web development, PHP, Python type work? Okay, so yeah. So whether or not this subscription is active, I could create a Boolean flag for that, which might make querying a little bit faster. Um, but generally, a subscription is active if it's not expired, if the end date of the subscription has not gone by. It says, I couldn't have, I couldn't have a time for working on my projects, but that will change in 2020. Okay, cool. Are you making some time in your life to do your own creative endeavors? What are you interested in learning or making? Do you have like project ideas or certain things you want to learn about, like tools or technologies you're interested in? Let me just get the reference docs up. I'll leave some of these open so I can recap the video. I don't remember what I did. That one's kind of obvious. So, now tricky part is with dates is like, do we handle time zones and stuff like that? I believe we should. I think we should uh, always have time zone in there. Even though UTC works pretty good, but then you have, yeah, just I think we should have time zone, date time with time zone. Aiden says, I'd like to make websites as freelancers, maybe some Discord bots. That sounds pretty interesting. Uh, that's how I actually started off learning to code, making websites as a sort of volunteer and freelancer. There's a lot of actually nonprofits that could really use help. And I think some of them even have budgets for technology coordinators and things like that. Are you based in the United States, Aiden? I guess it would be kind of U.S. daytime, isn't it? Or what, uh, what region are you in? Europe or Asia or U.S.? Just check out the Django date field and kind of stick with the defaults here. It's got a date input. Python date time date, which is not time zone aware. Actually, I don't think I need date time. Just the date field should be sufficient here. So yeah, then the time zone might throw people off. If their subscription expired hmm. at midnight, UTC, huh? Ah, oh, man, times and stuff are mind boggling. Aiden says, I'm from Hungary. It's 8 p.m. here. Okay, cool. So it's 9 p.m. here. Yeah, I started off doing um, websites, uh, kind of freelance stuff using WordPress and then Drupal. Both of those are pretty good, easy to learn, uh, easy to set up a website. You don't have to do any coding, really, and you can get quite far. So 
So I guess almost we should really be. Uh, whew, let me think. Let me just go with the date field. Man, and I'll just ask Mary to help me think this one through because this is not a simple thing. Aiden says, yeah, I was checking out WordPress. It looks easy to work with. Yeah, and notably it has one of the best user experiences for managing the content, organizing things. It's very blog centric, um, but it has you know pages and posts, these two archetypal content um, items that are, well, a little bit confusing for new people to WordPress. Like what's, what's a page and what's, what's a post? What's the difference? Um, I, so you just got to kind of reiterate, uh, like posts are for sort of timely or ephemeral content and pages are for like static or timeless content that, you know, like about us or our mission type pages don't change very often, but you still want to edit it and wagtail CMS. Um, if I may, uh, offer a suggestion gives a similar editing experience, content management experience to WordPress, really nice, clean to work with, um, pretty straightforward to learn and it's highly customizable and the developer experience has been just top notch in my experience. I had a little bit of, mm, I don't know if trepidations are over, but just uh, disinterest and sort of learning PHP and I've been really interested in Python. So this is the direction that I've taken and haven't had any major snags. Um, there have been some couple edge cases that I couldn't really do by default in Wagtail. Um, but I've opened up feature requests and they actually implemented uh, at least one of them, like within a couple of weeks, it was crazy. So the, the core Wagtail developers are also very responsive and very helpful and uh, friendly in nudging me over to Stack Overflow when I'm maybe asking how to do something as opposed to filing a bug or a feature request, but then also graciously or gracefully acknowledging um, when what seemed like a support request at first turned out that it was a feature request and so they reopened the issue, stuff like that. That goes a long way of sort of like building rapport and confidence in using a framework, a developer framework. Okay, I didn't remember sharing it with you before. Well, yeah, I'm so, sorry for repeating myself, but I, that was a quick summary also of why I think it's a really good thing. It's fairly easy to learn. <laughs> yeah, cool. And it's, yeah, I haven't even gotten to use some of these cool features like the image handling. And this I'm excited about. If we can make like a, an app out of the project because it has headless mode by default. See if I can find the docs there, but uh, so you can have an API and then just hook it into a JavaScript app or a, um, you know, Qt or what's that other one called? Um, I'm drawing a blank, but uh, Flutter. There we are. Do I only work with Python? Primarily, if I can, if I um, have it a chance. Well, actually, I should admit, I work a lot with SQL. So structured uh, query language, SQL. <laughs> I should even know what that means. I think it's, um, what does SQL stand for? Yeah, structured query language. I don't know why that just, like those, sometimes a word just sounds weird when you say it. Um, very useful, particularly if you wanna go into a development career or data science or data analysis or anything like that. Learn SQL. It's like the lingua franca when it comes to data. Um, other than that, I work with Python pref out of like, preference and the ecosystem is just remarkable. Uh, and it gets you at higher levels of abstraction so you can like solve problems with elegance rather than sort of bumbling around with reinventing the wheel or using flaky libraries that don't mesh well together or uh, are no longer maintained or I don't know. So I was doing, I, I do harsh on JavaScript a little bit, but I was doing JavaScript development for several years and made some cool stuff and enjoyed it. And I really like web standards 
and I like JavaScript as a language. It's growing and maturing, uh, but the ecosystem, I didn't realize how deficient it is. And, and, and you got really exciting stuff happening with like React and everything, but it's constantly reinventing itself and just churning, churning, churning. Yeah, and it's just wasteful. Wastes inordinate amounts of time. Creates ungodly complexity, just horrible complexity, build tools and uh, just stuff that's not enjoyable. It really starts to sap the joy out of the developer experience, particularly if you, and I wrote a project that we've got in production and we've been developing it for over four years now and now we have to rewrite it because the the community around this development framework just kind of evaporated. They went on to newer, greener pastures and more exciting technologies. And um, yeah, so just left the people in the lurch, man. <laughs> so those kind of reasons I'm just really bitten by the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, but we're also doing on this live coding series some cool JavaScript stuff. So yeah, don't, you know, just take what I say with a grain of salt. And uh, I don't mean to be too negative about it. Uh, so if you check out some of the other live streams that we've done recently on this music app, that's just using web platform technologies. And the web platform is uh, built to last. It's standardized so that the code you write should last for years and not have to like undergo revision or reinvention when the, when the whole ecosystem shifts. I think some of these shifts are leading the way, they're paving the way in order to reach standardization in certain aspects. But anyway, happy with Python and minimally using minimal JavaScript, just plain web platform. Biden says, yeah, I'm really hyped learning React, Node.js, and these web languages besides Python and Django. Okay, well that tell, is telling me, please do yourself a favor and avoid the hype cycle. Don't ride that hype wave. Take a step back and use some technologies that have been around for a while and are not gonna be vaporware or constantly churning. Like when you're riding a hype wave, you got that white water, that fluctuating water, like the crest of a wave pummeling you in your learning process. You're trying to learn all this and develop things and it's pummeling you and you're pummeling your projects. Uh, and some people like that. Some people like that surf uh, mentality. So that's like, is very exhilarating maybe, very exciting, very progressive. But I think you have to be pretty talented to, to stay standing in that type of an environment. Um, and I also think it's a little bit alienating because then it pushes this bar so high for the barrier to entry, makes it so difficult. And when I started learning to code, it was just, I could just start with some HTML and JavaScript and just make something. And now I'm back in this other music project. We're just using HTML and JavaScript and we're having fun and doing something. We don't have to have build tools or reactive frameworks and stuff. We're sort of teasing with the idea or toying with the idea of maybe reactivity, but yeah, just, just stick with something that's been around for a while that's not gonna blow away. And that doesn't maybe seem so exciting, like building a REST API, making Ajax calls using jQuery, Something like that. You learn the web platform technologies. That's my two cents. Yeah, so Aiden says, yeah, I want to work with Python, but I want to extend it later times. Yeah, so you got to kind of start to delineate where your project's going to exist. Where is it going to extend into the web? Is it going to extend into a client side project? Because that'll kind of inform your, your technology decisions. But you can go quite far with just Django and Wagtail, and Wagtail actually uses React. So I mean, if you're wanting to learn React, and certainly go ahead and do that kind of stuff if that's your passion and your interest in in TypeScript and stuff like that. Um, but note that there will be dragons, and it's not a smooth learning journey, and it, it's alienating. I think it, it it just kind of whittles out a lot of people who would otherwise be able to contribute in some meaningful way, and not just coders, but like designers and things like that. You know, people who could make a, an SVG or work with some CSS or make an HTML mockup with some CSS, now they have to like wrangle JavaScript, React code to fit, see how they're, they can decompose their um, design to fit some progressive paradigm that I think fundamentally might not be sound. I think. 
there's an, I'm reading increasingly that virtual DOM is inherently slow because it's an additional, it's an accoutrement or an additional cycle in the, in the render process, firstly. And secondly, I've never really seen a convincing argument, like data-based argument of that the DOM itself is slow. You know, maybe people were writing slow code that didn't update or manipulate the DOM, or I think the imperative code was like probably the main culprit. Now, instead of telling the DOM to update and insert this here, we can just tell um, the page how it should look and then let the framework sort of handle rendering things. So I think uh, that's still possible to have a declarative approach. And HTML is a declarative language. CSS are, you know, declarative styles, more or less. Yeah, and with this project here that I'm working on, we've gone really far with only a couple of sprinkles of JavaScript where needed. So you can just have a declarative experience just writing HTML templates. And SQL is a declarative language, by the way. The more we can, we're really accustomed to just saying, those curtains should be blue. And I love, you know, <laughs> get me a glass of water. I guess that's kind of declarative. Because more or less with SQL, you make a query like, give me all the people and their first and last names. And then the system figures out how to optimize that and bring that data back for you. And group them by, um, country or date of birth, something like that. Year of birth, let's say. Cool, so we're gonna add some date fields. What do you think? I don't have a really strong inclination. I believe just date fields should be good. Your magazine subscription expires on a date. Now that means after that day, you will not be able to access the mem members only content, but I don't know if hour to hour it matters. The thing is, if somebody subscribes in California, I don't want their subscription to end prematurely when a uh, UTC midnight. Hmm. Yeah, because it's like 9 p.m. here, and that means it's like 11 a.m. California time, so UTC, hmm, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, anybody in the chat have a suggestion if I should just be thinking about date time field and time zone is just, I think, hmm. But it's not again midnight. Now plus 30 days says Fox, Fox, cat. Thank you very much, Fox, Fox, cat. Now plus 30 days is exactly the approach we will take when people subscribe, but it will be now plus 365 days or something like that. Maybe, if we auto compute that field. <laughs> but we have to store it in the database is the thing, so I have to figure out and how it'll be used a little bit. Fox, Foxcat, have you gotten any uh, project, projects you're working on? All right, so we got use TZ as true. We support uh, when support for time zones is enabled, Django stores date-time information in UTC. All right. Uses time zone-aware date-time objects internally. Cool. And translates them to the end-user's time zone in templates and forms. Hmm. Fox Fox Cat says, nope, not right now. I've just been working my job. Burnt out. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't sound like a good... Situation you don't have any time for personal expression or creativity. Is it are you burnt out for the amount of hours or are you? Is it the type of work? Is it just not fulfilling your passion? Or are you not having opportunity to learn and grow? Is it like drudgery? What's the deal? Aiden Lang says uh, Hey, by the way, Aiden, how do you say your last name? Linge? Ling? I just want to say it correctly. Uh, Aiden's, I'll just say Aiden for a minute. Aiden says just one more question before going to bed because I have to work tomorrow. Could be responsible there, go to bed at a reasonable hour. What kind of extensions do you have? Uh, do I use in VS Code? Hey, check it out. Um, I just installed a cool extension. Where did it go? Hmm. It's called Live Share. Check this one out. It's a live collaboration environment. I'm hoping to use this on stream so that some um, friends and I 
can actually do live coding real time. It's even got video and audio built in uh, right in the IDE. So I'm gonna check that out soon. Ooh, my screen's getting dark because I just maximized things. Let's take another quick look. Maybe I'll get a little front light so it keeps everything illuminated. Check a quick look at my extensions so that you can go off to bed. Um, so at my day job, I'm working with AWS infrastructure. So we uh, we use AWS AWS uh, cloud formation templates and things like that. So I got this to help out when writing that YAML stuff. Uh, I want my code to be clean, so I use linters. Here's this. This is a live server. So when I'm working on this little HTML JavaScript music app, that's just no fanciness, no fancy front end or build tool or anything, no NPM, nothing. It's just HTML JavaScript. This live server will create a little Node.js server and re auto refresh every time I save uh, a file. So that's handy. Again, this live shares real-time collaborative development. It's from the comfort of your favorite something, 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 something. And then the Python. You know, if you're going to be working in Python, just grab that. But I don't have a whole lot of um, extensions installed. So yeah, if you have any extension recommendations, uh, I'd be glad to check them out. Uh, these debuggers might be handy to integrate with your development browser. Hmm. Uh, I was using GitLens for a while. This one's actually pretty snappy. And I think there was some, uh, whatever this sidebar is, there's a couple integrations for that. Fox Cass, Fox Fox Cass says, I don't have any creative thoughts for personal projects lately. Not sure. Okay, so it just sounds like you're so uh, burnt out, you're like super saturated, don't even have time for personal expression. That's that's a bummer. Hmm. Are you interested in working on some like open source projects that already exist where that might spark your creativity or give you some quick, um, you know, actionable tasks? Do you have any time or are you just is it your burnout more time related or just lack of enthusiasm? What What's the source there? All right, so I think I need to tell it to use time zones. And then I would have to use a daytime field. Iden says, thanks for your help. Have a great stream. See you guys later. Thanks for stopping in, Iden. Thanks for participating in the chat. See you around. Fox Foxcat says, I'm pretty new in the field, so it's just, I feel like I was super excited to get into the field, my first job, so I overdid it and went too hard. Yeah, that can be really easy. It can be enthusiastic and take on too many tasks. Uh, maybe be outside of your comfort zone too far, because we should be outside of our comfort zone because that's what fosters growth, that challenge and a little bit of adversity in your environment to like, you know, not adversity, like negativity, but just like, you know, it's gotta be a little bit challenging. But yeah, if you get too far out there, then it's just overwhelming. Just need to chill for a bit. All right, cool. Are you thinking about taking a sabbatical, do you think? Or can you arrange for a little bit different work or a lighter workload? What kind of options do you have to chill? We just don't have users in a lot of time zones. I'm wondering if uh, if this is non-issue and I'm overthinking it with this, just getting this, these fields on here. Let's actually just migrate those in. Uh, and I think I can just get by with a date field or a duration field might be cool. Mm. That would allow us to prevent overlap. There's a new constraint checker there. Now the job isn't too bad. I don't mean to, I need time off. Oh, so this is Fox Fox Cat speaking, or me speaking on behalf of Fox Fox Cat. Just time off from coming back home and studying personal projects. 
like two weeks holidays coming up. Yeah, that'd be nice. So maybe that'll give you a chance to reframe and think about your 2020 goals, you know, either if you're thinking about, you know, resolutions, like if you got any personal development stuff coming up or um, some learning you want to do or focus or change in directory in your trajectory or direction in life, you know, it's a good, good chance for reflection and getting back in touch with nature. If you can do it, just uh, will help clear your mind. So I'm either going to use a date field or this duration field to time delta. Hmm. I think I'm just gonna start with a date field. Yeah, and then actually the query is fairly straightforward, at least for getting the active subscription. It's just like, does this user have a subscription where the end date is greater than now? Right? So that's cool. The end date is greater than now. So, yes. And I will ask Mary if she wants it to have uh, times and awareness and then refactor the code after that. At least we'll have it committed today. So we need the start date and the, whoops, I'm scrolling past it. I'm thinking too much here. I'm just going to do it. Start date and end dates. Let's do it. The model, subscription model. And I'll need a handler in the, um, the form. I'll put these next to the duration so it's clear in the code. Miles our day field, what are our quargs? Verbose name, mm, start date's probably good. Auto now. Hmm, let think here, for the import. So for creating it in the, I think I'll handle those auto now. For creating a new subscription though, that would be nice just to stay starts now. Uh, Fox Fox Cat Sales. I think I should start looking for a new job for 2020. Yeah. Okay. So I want uh, to hone in on UI and accessibility front end stuff. Okay. That's really noble and interesting field. Actually, there's a lot of good stuff you can do there. Very cool. Uh, I got hired on as a full stack, but I do mostly front end UI stuff. Although I do get thrown a lot of WordPress related issues and support and maintenance. Yeah. That makes sense. I've not actually delved too much into WordPress internals, but I've worked with it as a CMS a lot. It's good, but not something I'd really want to peek under the hood. And I really just, I mentioned this early in the stream, like the WordPress ecosystem, like the plugins and theme ecosystem is just a massive commercialism. It's just like poof. everything's got a pro version, nag screens, nag screens that will evade your mouse, closing them and even automatically open windows. It's just that burned me out, put me off, and I haven't looked back. I went to Drupal for a long time, several years, five years, and now Wagtail and Django. Yeah, I hope they can get that under control because WordPress is otherwise really nice. Um, let's just copy these two, start date and end date. Oh yeah, I was gonna look something up real quick. Let me, in a new tab, there's a cool Mozilla blogger. Try and remember. Hmm. Who this author's name is. I'm 
Might be Manuela. Damiani. Hmm. They did a YouTube video. At a conference, and I was inspired by. <laughs> it's been a while since I've even watched. I was inspired by this, the the ethos in it, and the passion that goes into um, web platform usability. accessibility standards it's good stuff but I don't know if I'll be able to find it well I guess this Mozilla developer channel has some cool um, tutorials I think the I wish I could find this presentation but let me just new mobile game developers hmm this is Firefox Developer Channel. Mozilla Developer Channel. Let me just see if they have a playlist. Dev tools about web. Hey, it could have been from the About Web conference, actually, now that I think about it. Oops, sorry about that. Presenting this was uh, works at Mozilla, so I will not be able to find this. It's probably somewhere in my history, but that could have been months ago now. Darn it. What if I can search my history? Nikes. Well, here it is. Uh, Mozilla Developer Channel. Maybe there's some good stuff there. But yeah, what a browser do you use when you're mainly developing um, Foxbox Cat? Do you ever test things in Firefox? Or are you primarily doing uh, full stack with just Chrome? Uh, Foxbox Cat says, my company works with uh, theaters across America, so we're legally obligated to do accessibility for them. I grew to really like it. Yeah, I have to do cross browser. Okay, good. So, yeah, I think uh, cross browser testing has always been an issue on the web, but uh, even I've seen Firefox getting neglected a lot lately. All the latest versions. Yeah, so the evergreen browsers, that's cool. Yeah. So then you're pretty, you're becoming more and more familiar with web content accessibility guidelines. I swear, it's like Mozilla Talk on WCAG. Well, this Mozilla Developer Channel has a lot of information on that. It might have been from the About Web conference. Let me turn off my speakers real quick and mute my desktop audio so you don't get uh, playback. Oh, it was Ally. Uh, there's an Ally presentation, Ally Casts, Google Chrome developers. Well, that's cool, though. Maybe this is a good one. Ally Casts with Robin. There's a, a Mozilla um, accessibility advocate, though. Um, here's a good stream. All right, very cool. Anyway, let's wrap this up. Add a couple date fields, migrate those in. I don't know if I need to date time now. And we'll handle that in the form submission. How about that? Uh, they're required, so.
actually just a function to just I think I'm going to have to handle these timestamps in a minute, but let's go ahead and just uh, this is for the default value, by the way. Huh. I think it's just going to be easier to say null is true. Fox, Fox, Cat, are you going to be looking for like freelancing work or full time gig? What's your um, region? What region are you in, by the way? It might not matter, but uh, yeah, it might. Just out of curiosity. Wait, did I already ask? In the UK, okay, cool. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can help with any suggestions there. But UK is a really big market. There's some co-ops, like design co-ops, that might be a little bit better. I was actually... A creative co-op, co-op, co cooperative design studio. This might be a cool one. But I'm Canadian. Yeah, well, yeah. We're in an international world. We, I'm in Finland and I'm from the uh, United States. But check out some of the co-ops. Like, uh, I think that's gonna give you a really good opportunity to grow in a unique and personal direction. And also just have a say in how the companies work working and personal stake like a ownership in the company and the uk has a very um vibrant co-op community in fact i think it was founded there the cooperative movement the rochdale principles rochdale principles where was that rochdale maybe i'm totally just forgetful in rochdale england yeah Digital co-ops. There's several, several of them all around the country. Boom. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've been looking at these co-ops uh, lately. Now, Finland has the most co-ops per capita, but they don't tend to be worker co-ops, which is um, actually I'm a member, a co-founder of a worker cooperative here. It's called an Osuskunta. Uh, they're so the co-ops here are usually um, kind of like buyers co-ops, like food or products. There's this group called S Ruma or S Group, uh, of which I'm a member, and it's a national cooperative of uh, grocery chains and like big stores, like uh, I don't know, department stores, is the right word. It's sort of like 
a Walmart or something or Target equivalent. I don't know what they have in the UK like that or Canada, but similar, not quite as like, I don't know. And I'm part of a cooperative bank, so that's cool. Also spunky. Hey, what's up, level two? Welcome. He says, so there's 13 music notes, and in those 13 notes, there are regular, sharp, and flats. Yeah, I think there's 12 notes in the circle, the musical circle, and yes, regular, sharp, and flat. Or you could just, uh, there's two classes. There's, um, di <laughs> let's see, what is it? Diatonic and inharmonic, something like that. <laughs> level two has been working on this music thing. Diatonic is just something that's in the key, and the inharmonics are the ones that are out of key, and we call those sharps or flats, but... And then the 12-tone um, uh, is also a form of music composition, but when we're talking about the chromatic notes of Western music, chromatic scale, uh, that's a 12-tone scale. Equal tempered, meaning they've actually taken this uh, natural spiral of uh, tones and their sort of upper partials is this spiral of these notes that are related uh, that never circles back around on itself and then they kind of turn it into a circle. So all, all the notes are kind of equidistant and then you can go full circle and arrive where you started. Uh, that's called temperament. They uh, they tempered the scale, and that's what allows like modern compositional approaches like jazz to flourish because you can go to all these keys and things. But yeah, this is what you're looking for the chromatic scale. You're probably reading down that level two. Yeah, um, fox, 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 cat. I'm just gonna say fox, <laughs> if it says a little bit like an expletive. But uh, we've been in uh, this live stream. We on other days we've been working on a musical experimental application. I've actually got it deployed here. If you're interested in music theory, See if it'll work. Oh, okay, so I've turned off my speakers and I've muted desktop audio. Did that work for you? Can you hear that? I, I can't hear that. Let me double check. <laughs> nice. Okay, is it too loud? Is that pretty obnoxiously loud? Here we go. And I'll show you this. Okay, and then uh, level two says, yeah, isn't this all the notes here? And links to pitch class space. Ooh, this one sounds cool. It was in the uh, wiki. Okay, so yeah, notice how that this has slash in between it. These are called inharmonics. They mean it's the same vibration, but two different names. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve tones in the chromatic scale. Yeah, it's the same one. You got that. You found it. And you know, this is just one musical system, uh, but it's just predominant and pretty useful. But the, yeah, the, the whole inharmonic and chromatic stuff, it's just very confusing. That's why we're trying to make really simple and intuitive musical interfaces, because the theory can be mind boggling, but uh, which can be off putting, you know, just like writing TypeScript or something, uh, just alienates people, uh, maybe unnecessarily, who could otherwise be, or react, I don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, to take a jab at that. We wanna keep it simple and let people, you know, children, adults, elderly people, just approach it and start making stuff, making music.
uh, and particularly through intuitive means like touching stuff, direct manipulation, like touching tones, touching a Christmas tree and seeing what comes out of that. So yeah, that's rather, that's rather jam we've been working on. And level two is digging into the theory. Level two says, so in the tonic library, you pass in an A to get an A note and an A sharp to give a sharp A note. Yep. And what for the flat? Um, for the flat, it's a B, the lowercase letter B. What are we passing for the flat? So yeah, if we look in tone JS, well, I wish they just had a really um, clear way, just they would show you how this works. Somewhere they would say what the notation system is, but uh, music, T-I-F-I-C. There's a scientific notation, scientific pitch notation. <laughs> I think they're using that. Oh boy, maybe I'm off the... Also known as American Standard Pitch Notation or International Pitch Notation, specifying musical pitch by combining a musical note name with an accidental if needed, and an octave number. So that's where we can go up and down the piano forte. Nomenclature. Good grief. See, this stuff is just so like dense and hard to figure out and put connect the dots, man. And we're just trying to make it really obvious. But yeah, so normally you use this like flat symbol, but in computers it's t hard to get the flat symbol, so we use a lowercase b. Now the hashtag or hash mark or pound symbol is easier to find on a keyboard, so you can just use that. Very cool. This is interesting stuff though. Thanks for bringing it up, level two. Uh, let's see, level two says, so A flat for A flat note, yep. And all notes are A through D. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A through G. And uh, interestingly, uh, Bach uh, composed, uh, they, the Germans have a notation that uses H instead of B. Uh, Well, let me confuse you, but it's A through G. Uh, different from English in two respects, namely that beef, be natural, is that natural? Ah, oh, good grief. You can tell I'm, I'm like, yeah. Uh, is referred to by the letter H and B flat by the letter B. So Bach could actually compose music by spelling his name. But that was even more confusing. So we just use A through G. Mmm, damn German making things difficult. Okay. <laughs> well, but they also make things very precise and high quality, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So we, we're just looking for the simplest representations of music that we can allow people to uh, explore and, and create. And make stuff. And it's all web standards. It's web audio API with a JavaScript library that helps us. Uh, make notes and change the way the notes sound, the timbre, by combining different waveforms and filters and effects. It's really cool. We will be working on that, I think, this weekend. Level 2, do you got any plans this weekend? Can you swing by for some live coding? So now that I've got that field migrated, and I think I can just take a look here. It was right underneath the subscription type. Oh yeah, I need to add it to the UI. So we've got a start and end date. So here, we so this is a regular old Django model, Django model. So it, you just define your fields and the field type and some other metadata. Then we have to tell Wagtail to render this admin form, which has some panels in it. And Wagtail does everything else after that. But we want, underneath the duration, just copy that twice. We want to start date and end date. I'll just copy that. So oh, no, just very cool. Now, if I refresh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have two fields and they just let you pick a, a date on a calendar. This is really cool. Uh, we're going a little longer than I expected, so the T is going through me. I will be right back if you don't mind, waiting for just a moment.
All right, thanks for waiting. Let's see if there's any conversation. BRP Power Company's on the phone. All right. Hey, level two says in work. Uh, okay. Uh, let me double check what level two said. Okay. Uh, level two would like to help stream on the weekend. Work on it. And uh, get a better understanding of music and stuff. That's cool. Uh, if you notice down below the video, um, on the Twitch thing, uh, I did put a schedule there so that um, you'll have a little bit of advanced notice when I'm streaming and I've got, uh, I actually don't have a calendar reminder, but I'll get more in the habit of being, planning ahead, knowing what we're going to work on and, you know, having a schedule. I think that can't hurt. And that way we can start collaborating and building this cool project. Yeah. I've even got a, an idea for the name, but I was kind of hoping to, um, to rename it as like a part of the discussion next week. So, or this Saturday. So stay tuned. And I got to do a little bit of search to see if there's a domain name available. Okay. So we got this, uh, date fields in there and forms. And basically, now the form doesn't need to show the date field because I don't want the user to necessarily create that. But when I'm processing the form, I do want to create that date field. So I'll have to take a look at the duration. And here comes the math that uh, that Fox Fox or Fox Fox Two I don't know, mentioned earlier. So when we're uh, processing a subscription form, not only do we now check out the user, but But we would do that in the same loop, wouldn't we? So, let's organize this code just a bit. Grab the subscription. Cool. Let me explain a little bit of the why there. Subscription dot start date. And I don't know if just date time now will work. Because that, uh, I don't need to call it. Date time now returns a date time object, right? See if I can get today's date. Good grief. I have just stopped clicking basically websites and now I only read hacker news comments to understand anything about the world. Oh. Or Stack Overflow. I might click those. Mm. From daytime, daytime today. That's gonna be nice and clean. All the way to the bottom. Scrolling fast. Sorry for the motion sickness. I think I might get to use a, a nice uh, library here to do human friendly time manipulation. Let's just check the comments real quick. Um, all right, so level two has been able to open the file from GitHub and run it at least. Yeah, so I, I run it right from GitHub. <clears throat> I got a syntax error here where Oh no, that's that's fixed now. 
Yeah, uh, this is uh, level two, by the way, are you using VS Code? Because I can show you a cool trick. If you're using the VS Code, check out, oops, that's the wrong thing there. Can you see my, oh, you can't see that. Uh, actually, if I click this button here, check out live server. It's not super well maintained apparently. But it gives you a little button down here that says go live. And it basically spins up a little probably node JS server or something. Uh, and every time you check and opens your browser, your default browser, and every time you change something in your code, it'll refresh the browser window pretty reliably. Even if you're editing code in different files, I notice, or dropping when I was dropping like those SVG images in there or adding the SVG image in Inkscape, uh, I was seeing the browser refresh. So there's something there that's working pretty good. So I can send you the link here somehow. Maybe. Cancel that. If you want to check it out. All right, so I get today's date, <clears throat> and let's see if there's a, I'm getting a lot of tabs open. I don't really like getting so many tabs open, but I'm trying to remember what I'm doing here. I can close this one. I'll close that one, we're not using it. I think I can use, uh, I want to do it in an elegant way. But at least it should be Pythonic. Python date util package. Is this a third party? No, it's not. Well, this is pretty good. Relative delta. And there's this, there's Maya. Which was re updated recently, it's sort of abandoned where, I don't know if this, if Kenneth Reitz has just dropped off the Python landscape or what's going on there, Tim Fourier's And uh, Arrow doesn't have a good uh, sort of a fluent API. Not that it's bad, but it's well maintained. Pendulum has a fluent API that I'm look, looking for is like uh, now plus one year where I can just express it in, you know, very plain English, what I'm trying to achieve. So the code is self-documenting. Uh, better days and times. Now Arrow is, uh, includes time zone by default, which is one improvement. 
manipulating them. Hmm. And I do like working with Moment.js. So that's one of the parts of the library, the JavaScript ecosystem that shines, but although I think now Moment has been superseded so by some other library. If I go to the Moment.js website, they say like, you might also be interested in this other library. No, okay, I'm being a little bit cynical. Luxion, Luxon. So anyway, okay. I've gotten a lot of mileage at the moment. Let's just take a look. Shift, I think we want to shift. Well, that's pretty clean. Uh, if there's an arrow, then I need to. Hmm, that's a fairly fluent API. How do I get it back to a date object though? How do I get it to the type? Dang it. Yeah, there we go. All right, let's try arrow. What do you all think? Anybody opposed to that? That way it's explicit that we're in UTC. To date. See, what's the order? Import arrow. I got real quiet in the chat. Level two, you still there? Did you take off? Anyway. All right, let's hop back down here. And so now we want this daytime arrow UTC now date. And then UTC now. Shift. I think it was like year plus one. Uh, plus the well, I'm duplicating these here. Let's let's do this. And what else I was trying to do, and that's the syntax here, was, um, yes, duration. Um, well, I don't have to do this. This is, this is already going to be obvious if I do this. 
So we're shifting it plus. Is this obvious? Is this getting? Difficult to read. Meh. I think it's good. Pros. Level two's in lurk mode. Yeah, cool. No worries. It's cool to be in lurk mode sometimes. Let's see if this is going to work now. So essentially, I'll delete the subscription since I made before and see if these dates are added there. Pendulum. Pendulum has a nice website. And I like the API, I think, if I recall. Mm. But if I look at their GitHub, addition and subtraction, let's just check that out real quick. Uh, <clears throat> you can just add a certain number of years. That's pretty clean API, add years equals subscription duration. I like it. But August 10th, a lot of contributors but yeah, I'm just getting worried about, I don't know, this is not just generally the Python ecosystem, but when I see that kind of a commit graph, particularly as I think the main contributor is still around, but nobody's contributed, obviously, since, since the last commit. Whereas I think Arrow had a little bit better story, but that's just for... Uh, being thorough, let's just look at that again. A lot of contributors, and it's got a pretty nice API, and it's got a really sudden burst of activity recently. It's been around for a long time. Quite interesting. It's gone through several maintainers, looks like. Well, Sierra Smith Dev has been around there. So yeah. Ah oh, yeah, right, because it's there. It's there a repository. So they're still around, that's a cool thing. In December they've done some activity, so it's not abandoned where. Alright, I'm gonna go with Arrow. But shout out to Pendulum. And shout out to Maya. All right, let's go ahead and delete my subscription. And I gotta run the server to do that. I'm out of tea, I went long, I drink, drunk? I've had a liter of tea. delete. I actually didn't need to delete it, but I'll just make it simple. Now I have to add the subscription to the form up front, so let's see if I get an error message. Uh, let's start with one year. And good grief, I thought that would happen. Okay, it is plural. All right, that's, that's good. And we don't really have to pay for it. But I'll do that for closure. All right, now we can hop over here. The Wagtail Admin UI subscriptions, which is a custom area. Whoop, don't want to delete it, I want to edit it. Oh. Oh. Hey, it worked. Man. And 
And it could be that when I am checking the, that the user has an active subscription, did I convert the uh, subscription end date to their local time zone at that point? And as long as their local clock still says it's that date, then let them, let them check it out. I think that's a reasonable one. That keeps our, our data model simple. I don't have to really think too hard about time zones and stuff, which is just not fun to think about. All right, cool. Let's commit these changes. You know, maybe this is where I should start actually writing some tests, <laughs> submitting that form and with various uh, values. Let's submit that form with various values. Be the same. Let's change the uh, print only true cost, the, the subscription type, and let's not pay for it. Just be lazy about it. Go to the add in section. Subscriptions, one that's not paid. This one, edit it. It works because my duration field's an integer and to the number of years and then so the the code can be just very clean okay ah uh. So I sort of have two different, let me see. Yeah, there's the start date end fields where I uh, edited the model, start date and end date. And I should probably do these in two commits. Let me think here. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter, I'm the only one committing on this. All right, very cool. I am getting ready to wrap it up and do a recap video. We call it a night, it's 10.30 here, but essentially made some good progress today. So yes, indeed. Thank you to everybody who's stopped by the Twitch chat. It's been really nice. It's always fun 
to get off topic and have something else to focus on than just coding nonstop. And thanks level two for continuing uh, your enthusiasm for this music project. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty tired. It's 1030 here and I've been code, live coding for two and a half hours now. I usually try to limit myself to about two hours in a single sitting or single session. So I'm kind of hungry. I actually, I had a little bit of an early dinner, but I'm, maybe I'll just need my evening snack or iltapala as we call it here. Yeah, yeah, you too have a good night, uh, level two. It's good seeing you. And, uh, yep. If you need anything or if, uh, ping me on GitHub with that music thing, if you have any questions or ideas, you can open a GitHub issue and I'll try to respond. And, you know, if you're having questions about the music theory in the meantime, uh, before the next stream, uh, you know, GitHub's a good form. I'll also try to check the, um, the Discord. I haven't been actually logging into that very much. So, yeah, that way I can follow up. We can continue the discussion offline. Let's see here. Thanks, Fox Fox Cat, for also uh, being pretty active in the chat. It's nice to see uh, new people around. I don't think I've seen Fox Fox uh, Cat here before. Uh, no, we just met. They live in the UK. And who else? Let's double check. And Iden Iden Lang Ling. Yep, not sure how to pronounce the name. They've been here, but I think it's been a little bit. Thanks for also participating in the chat. If you're watching this video on a another platform like YouTube or whatever, um, please do feel free to leave me any questions or comments in the section below the video, and I will try to respond to those in a timely manner. If you'd like to contribute to this Western Friend project or any of the other open source uh, projects, the Western Friend source code is available on GitHub at uh, github.com slash Western Friend. You can see that right below my video here. And if you're wanting any advice on, on getting started with, with Python and Django, uh, I highly recommend the Code Buddies community. This broadcast is part of an ongoing live series here at codebuddies.org. We have people, both learners and mentors in many different technologies and frameworks. So if you're not interested in Python or Wagtail, Django, then that's cool. Whatever you're interested in learning, TypeScript, you know, JavaScript, Ruby on Rails, PHP, you name it. There's somebody there that can help you along your way. And heck, you might be that person to help somebody else along their way. It goes both ways. We're all kind of in there helping each other out. So yeah, do stop by codebuddies.org. It's a great community. They're pretty active on Twitter and uh, they've got a Slack channel and stuff like that. Okay, well, this has been another live coding session wrapping up. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.